Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile and welcome to my reading life. So I have actually been reading the book for a couple of days now, but yesterday was the first day that I got to start the actual story because I was in the middle of reading the introduction, which uh, I am reading the Barnes and Noble Classics edition and the introduction was by a gentleman named Stephen Marcus. Sorry, my book's just over there on my desk. In the past, I've never really enjoyed being inside of Emma's head because she's a bit of a snob. And yeah, so I'm curious to see if I will enjoy it more this time. I think with Emma's circumstances being so secure and so different from so many of the other circumstances that we see our heroines from Jane Austen novels in, it's a little bit harder to relate to her. It's like, what do we do with a character who is rich and beautiful and intelligent and charming and interesting and has everything kind of going for her? But it's also part of the genius of the novel because this is a character that Jane Austen hasn't done before. This is ground that she hasn't tread before. Enough about that. Now I want to actually like talk about some of the themes that I'm noticing appearing in I've I think I've read the first three chapters now and I always find that I take pages and pages of notes when I first begin a book because so much is being set up in the beginning uh, and then it drops off as I continue through the story. Again with the setup, Emma has everything which means she will need an outside sort of impetus to move her. But the other thing is that Emma also has a great deal of power, unlike her other heroines. So she has enough power to sort of remove her obstacles, both social and, you know, sort of positional power, if you will. But she also has enough resources in terms of her intellect and imagination and her influence to be able to remove a lot of obstacles from that perspective as well. In that way, <laughs> she can sort of exert all of these different talents and levels of influence to sort of stay in the womb of happiness, if you will, or as the novel puts it, has had very little to vex her. So she can stay where she is with very few vexations, but of course the, the novel is going to force her to move to change anyway. We also see that there's sort of like this closing down of the family circle. Emma lost her mother at a very young age. Then her sister, who is quite a bit older than her, got married. Then a governess at the beginning of this novel, or right before the action of this novel, has who's been her companion and sort of a surrogate mother figure, has gotten married and moved away. And so it's easy to see how Emma has this sort of unconscious connection between marriage and death. All of these are, both of these are forces that have taken the major female figures out of her life. I would connect it to my discussion of Anna Karenina, in which I talk about how love and death are symbolically intertwined very much so in the tradition of Western literature. Of course, death is just death, but love is actually kind of death and rebirth. Again, this sort of symbolic language is something that I've talked a lot about. Also in my discussion of the Arthurian romances, so I'll link both of those videos. It's love is a sort of a self-sacrifice, a death of the self, and it's a rebirth into your new consciousness, into your adulthood, into maturity, into a new frame of life. But it's also symbolically linked with, of course, children and motherhood and the renewal of the family, the renewal of humanity. Um, and so that's how love is linked, obviously, with rebirth and babies. And we have this imagery of babies sort of used as well with Mrs. Weston and her older sister, Mrs. Knightley, throughout the novel, which we'll see. So considered in this light, Emma's declaration never to marry takes on a sort of like deeper, deeper psychological significance than merely being influenced by her sort of change resistant, change averse, quasi hypochondriac father, right? And so it's not on a conscious level, she's sort of abiding by this prejudice against change that exists in her family culture and from the pressure of her father. But unconsciously, I actually think she's working with a death fear here. Ironically, it is also the fear of death that's ultimately going to motivate her to be willing to take the risk to change and get married. Because of course, to remain unchanged just to be calcified, and that is actually the real path to death. And so she ultimately comes around to the conclusion that marriage is worth, worth the risk. And in fact, you know, there's a, a real literal level of risk here because childbirth was dangerous at this time and women got pregnant a lot and they had a lot of babies. And so you had this iterated risk that compounded upon itself. So that's sort of a literal level on which this exists. But anyway, point being that to remain the same is another type of death. And so 
Emma is willing ultimately to sacrifice one for the other, saying that the other marriage and love have the sort of renewal and rebirth symbols tied up with them as well. Two more themes that are being developed through the narrative of Mr. Weston is this idea of social mobility. And so that's something that comes a lot uh, up a lot with the town of Highbury. It's sort of like this village, almost town. It's growing in size. And we see that over the course of time, Mr. Weston has been able to become sort of like he move his way up and become part of the gentility. This would be something that's a very slow change compared to what we're used to. So this is something that even in the book says took two to three generations to complete. There's social mobility, but it's very slow. And that's where I think we see that tension between progressivism and traditionalism in uh, Austin coming through once again. We also have a theme of dependence versus independence being starting uh, starting to shape up here when we contrast his two marriages, so his marriage early in life to the Miss Churchill, who was much wealthier. And so she was the one who was sort of giving up everything to marry him and came in with the wealth and the position and the status versus his second marriage. So when he marries Miss Taylor, Emma's governess, he now has come into more wealth, has made himself a more uh, stable person economically. And he's the one Who's sort of bestowing a position of security and wealth and power to someone less fortunate. And so this idea of having independence is highly, highly valuable. And in fact, that's part of what Emma doesn't want to give up when she gets married. And so we're seeing this tension, which also is expressed in the first marriage uh, of Miss Churchill, who became the first Mrs. Weston. It's this tension of like, Emma wants to become, get married, but she doesn't want to give up the position of power that she has of being, you know, Emma of Hartfield, right? And so we had Miss Weston of Enscombe. That's the name of the house, right? And so it's like, what are you giving up and what are you getting? That is, of course, the mercenary side of marriages. And then the fourth thing that I noticed is that Mr. Woodhouse seems to be a bit of a hypochondriac, and I'm not the first person to ever notice this, but I do know that Jane Austen's mother was also a bit of a hypochondriac, and so I wonder how much of that is inspiring this character, and we've seen it in other characters as well. Mrs. Bennett, Bennett has like, you know, fanciful nerves and flutterings running up and down her body. She has these like made up, you know, symptoms that aren't really real. And we see that with Mr. Woodhouse as well. So I see that sort of influence coming in as something that she's really thinking about. But of course, that's also tied in with a death fear. So anyway, I wonder how much of this is like autobiographical. No, you're not really supposed to do that in literary criticism is connect, is to presume autobiographical influences, even though we know that authors are obviously influenced by their own experiences in their own lives. It's just that you don't know which parts are the autobiographical parts. There's no way to tell for certain. But, you know, we have this character of Emma who is so intelligent and so witty and really, you know, outclasses everybody who's in her company. And so I can't help but thinking that some of the feelings that Emma has are some of the feelings that Jane Austen herself experienced. And she's, you know, doesn't want to get married. And Jane Austen seems to have been quite reticent to get married. And, and obviously chose not to, either through circumstances or life. And then we also see, obviously, this hypochondriac parent, which we know is also true for Jane Austen's life. So is it a way for Jane Austen to imagine what her experience would have been like if she had all of the financial security in the world? I don't know. But that's what I've gotten out of the first three chapters of Emma so far. I hope you guys are enjoying your Jane Austen July or whenever you're reading Jane Austen that you're enjoying reading her because I certainly am. And until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile. <laughs>